the British candle. Sounds like something that would be kind of cool, like a neat story. Uh, in the history of the church, church history, they call it the British candle. Uh, but it's a name for one of the most horrific acts that was taking place against a Christ follower. Uh, two bishops, Bishop Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley, uh, they had been jailed in Rome for their beliefs uh, in uh, in, in Protestant uh, Christian beliefs going against the Roman Catholic Church. These two men uh, that, were, that were passionate about uh, turning the, the Roman Church away from uh, what has become kind of this organized uh, religion or this government religion and saying, hey, we, we, want, we want to see people transformed by the power of the gospel like we saw in the early days. They were, they were during the time of the revolution, but on Oct- or, sorry, the Reformation on October 16th, 1555. After 18 months in jail, jail these, two, um, these two bishops were brought together at Oxford. Each of these men were tied to the same stake in Oxford. A bundle of sticks was placed underneath them, and it was set to fire. As the fire started to rise, Ridley, one of the bishops, said out to Latimer, the other one, he said this, Be of good heart, brother, for God will either assuage the fury of the flame or else strengthen us to abide in it. And as the fire grew, Latimer had a chance to return some encouragement to his fellow brother in Christ. And he said this to Ridley. He said, be of good comfort, Master Ridley. Play the man. We shall this day such light, light such a candle by God's grace in England, and I, as I trust, shall never be put out. It was by these two bishops suffering well in the early church that they, there, there was this revolution, this reformation that took place, and many other martyrs that these two bishops suffered well in persecution for the glory of God and his name and for his name only. And it was because of that, a couple of years later, the queen of England passed away and uh, her half-sister took over, who was a Protestant, and it began this revolution, this reformation all across Europe. There was this incredible thing that took place because a few men, a few faithful men of God said, hey, we're gonna bring it back to the beginning, back to the start of this thing called Christianity. Today, we're closing out our chapter on 1 Peter chapter 3, not the whole series, but chapter 3, and we're going to talk through suffering and persecution. And as I keep saying every single week, um, this seems like one of those books of the Bible that every week it's like heavy hitting, it's hard, and it's like, man, is there any encouragement in here for somebody? Like, can you give me something, Peter? Because it's just heavy week after week, but it's good at the same time. And so let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse uh, verse 13 through 22. A lot of scripture this morning. Let's read it. Now, who is there to harm you uh, if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect." having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good than it is, uh, if it should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness, uh, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as a appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Now, a lot of scripture here, we're going to breeze through some of it, we'll camp on some of it, but Peter is now back to this idea of suffering well for the glory of God. This is not something that we probably will experience, at least in my lifetime, I don't think we're going to experience unless God calls me to be a missionary in some persecuted country. But if you are a follower of Jesus in America, more than likely, this is something that it can feel very removed and distant to think about suffering for the kingdom of God. Um, and, and Peter brings it back again because he's writing to these people. If you remember, as we've kind of 
reiterated throughout this series is he's writing to these people of God that are all across modern, uh, modern, day church, modern day Turkey, Asia Minor, and he's writing these letters to people that are suffering and being persecuted. They're living as slaves. They're going through really challenging times. And Peter's like, listen, when you suffer, I want you to suffer well. Suffer for the glory of God. So let's look back at verse 13. There to harm you if you are zealous for what is good. This verse can be a little bit challenging. Who can harm you uh, if you are zealous for what is good? I, I think this carries a dual meaning. You look at this, this one verse, it carries kind of a dual meaning here. Uh, in the first part of it, uh, these last few chapters, he's been talking about how to, how to be a good citizen. Like if you were to live as a follower of Jesus in a world that is, uh, that is, that is angry towards the ways of God, that is, um, that is uh, against the ways of the kingdom, he's saying uh, you need to learn how to be a good citizen. He talked about how we obey the government, which everybody loves in America, I know. We need to obey the government. We need to, we, if you are, and he's writing to people that were possibly slaves at the time, not, not in a sense of American slavery, but a little bit different. And he says, if you're a slave, then serve your master well. He talks to wives and husbands. Wives submit and husbands love and, and care and do the things that I'm asking you to do. Why? So that you will learn to do good in the situation that you're in. Learn to live the life that God has called you to no matter where you are at. What he's essentially saying here is as a follower of Jesus, don't go looking for persecution. Don't go looking for persecution. Don't go out into the street and, and say something provocative in a, in a dangerous situation. Get beat and then say, well, look, I'm being persecuted. No, Peter's saying, listen, as a follower of Jesus, be a good citizen, serve your family, serve the government, serve your master, do what you need to do and do it well. If you're gonna stand out and be a revolutionary, you're gonna suffer, he's saying. But he encourages them, do good. The same call that God gives the people of Israel when they're in captivity in Jeremiah chapter 29. Chapter 29, verse 7, uh, and, and what the prophet to the people of God says this, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf and, and for, it, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. This is one of the most uh, challenging thoughts is that we could be in a difficult situation like like the people of Israel. Uh, you could be in a different, difficult situation like these new Christ followers that Peter is writing to. And he's saying, I want you to live your life in such a way that you make the city and the, the society around you better. Make the society around you better. Live your life well. Now, what we want to do, and, and I want you to hear me, I think this is a part of it, but this is not the whole. What we want to do in our, our culture is we wanna say, okay, the way that we make that well is that we put all of our hope in politics. How many has ever been lied to by a politician? Anybody? Even your favorite one has lied to you. Did you know that? I'm just, maybe I'm just a little too skeptical. I don't know. Maybe it's a cynic in me. But I just think politics is a horrible savior. And so are we putting our hope in those things? Or are we saying the way that I make a difference in the kingdom and in the world is by living my life the way that God has called me to live and seeking the welfare of my city? See, we care way too much about what happens in Washington while we ignore what happens in Magnolia. We've got to learn to live the life that God has called us to live. This is why we, we are around here. You're going to hear it. If you come here for any amount of time, everyday followers, you're going to get tired of hearing it. You're going to be like, I wish Derek would not say that anymore. But we want you to remember it every single day. Do good. Most people are not going to punish you for doing good is what he's saying. But the second part of this meaning is more from an end times eschatological viewpoint when he says uh, that there will be those that because of their beliefs that are going to be antagonistic and hostile towards you. We see this in the Middle East with radical Islam. The, the radical Islamists, they, they don't care if you're doing good in your city. They don't want you around, right? Persecution, right? That, that's the idea that we see in places like India, have laws against even becoming uh, an evangelical or a Christ follower. 
And so we see it around the globe, the persecution. But notice what he says, who can harm you? Who can harm you? There are those that are going to harm you, but who can harm you? The thought being this, even if you are persecuted, even if your life is taken for the kingdom of God, they cannot harm or take your spirit. You belong to God. And I know that when you talk about persecution, it feels like so far and removed. It's like, well, this doesn't make any sense because we, you know, I, I might get laughed at if I knock on somebody's door and I try to share the gospel. But that's not really persecution. It might hurt our pride a little bit, but that's not persecution. Like, I, I don't know many Christ followers in America that are being persecuted, but we got to think that the Bible is not written for us here in America. Did you know that around the world, currently, one in seven Christians around the globe are facing persecution, real life, difficult persecution. That is more than 365 million Christians across the globe right now. That is almost 40 million more than all of America's population. Think about that for a moment. You think about 365 million, that's, that's a lot of people, but you don't really know anybody, you don't hear about it. 365 million Christ followers are facing persecution right now. That's astronomical. And so Peter's words still ring true. But Peter's viewpoint is always, as it always is, it's on, it's on this future hope that we have in Jesus. Notice what you like, they, they can't harm you. Peter mentioned this in the, in the next verse, verse 14, when he says this, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are going to be blessed. You know what, <laughs> in our comfortable version of Christianity, you know what we would probably never say is when we face suffering, we're like, whoo, whoo I'm so blessed this morning. No, we, we put things like blessed on our license plate when you finally make it big and you got the vanity plate and you have the black Mercedes. Hashtag blessed. And it's got the gold, like the little bling around the outside of it. That, that, that's what we, we think blessed is only when we receive some kind of financial benefit. We think blessing is only when we receive health benefits. That is not, that is not blessing. The blessing that we get, the ultimate blessing is that we're going to spend eternity with the creator of the universe. Not finances. Can he bless you financially? Absolutely. But he may not. He may not give you that check in the mail. You just walk, you hear these stories, right? Somebody's like, well, I just walked home. I opened up the mailbox and there was a check for the exact dollar amount. And you're like, what? He can do it. But it doesn't mean he's going to do it for all. Your blessing will sometimes look different. He says, you will be blessed. The more that you read and you study the scriptures, the more you see this, this separation between the comfortable life that we live as American Christians versus what the early Christians faced. It's a pretty modern idea for Christianity to be comfortable. You know, I, I was telling the, we have a pre-service rally with our volunteers for those that can't make it into the service because they're serving. And my youth pastor used to have, have us do this thing where we would take a, um, for the young people in the room, we didn't always have these. You had to carry an actual camera around and video people. And he would tell us, and we'd go on these trips, he would say, listen, I want you to go witness to people, share the gospel, and I want you to video it. I was terrified. You, like walking up to random people, and they're wanting to buy something. They don't want to hear from some, some like scrawny teenager. And you walk up and you, you, you just like start talking and you're videoing, you're like, your, your, your hands are shaking. I was like, I don't even think you need, I don't think they believe that I believe what I'm saying because I'm so nervous. James, in his letter, he, he says, count it all joy when you face trials of many kinds. Wow, okay, that's, that's probably not something I would. I thank you, Lord, for that trial. Thank you, Lord, for that suffering. The disciples, they prayed for boldness when they faced the persecution and asked. You, you know what, like when they got together and they're facing persecution, Stephen gets stoned. They gather in this, they gather in this room to study and to pray. You know what they don't pray for? They don't pray for their safety. What do we do? Oh, Lord, would you put a hedge of protection around them? What is even a hedge of protection? Can somebody explain that to me? Because I've been confused since I was a little child. 
Is there like a, a thing of bushes that walks around us? They prayed for boldness. Would you give us more boldness, God? Spirit of God, in boldness to keep preaching this message. And it's like, in America, we're like, don't let me, don't let me get laughed at. You see the difference? That's what I'm trying to say. Some of y'all are like, you know, listen, I have no shame. I'll, hey, I need to tell you about Jesus. If you die today, where are you going? <laughs> Peter says, you're blessed when you face persecution. Now, I want to give a clarification here. He's not saying that the actual act of the persecution would be, would be fun or pleasant. You think these bishops that were burned at the stake in, in, in Oxford, you think that they, they thought, this is awesome. They did not. But they knew that their suffering was going to produce something. Because Peter, Peter's human just like you and I. He knows what pain is. He saw Jesus crucified Right? He's, now seen, he's now seen some of the disciples be stoned to death or, or, or martyred. And, and it is in light of that that Peter says, you will be blessed because you're going to be warded, rewarded by your Father in heaven because of your persecution and your suffering. Doesn't that feel so different than the prosperity gospel? It's like, hey, um, let me just, I'm going to say, y'all, some, some, if you see somebody on TV saying that you need to sow $1,000 and you're going to get $10,000, don't do it. Just give it to collective. Because when they're in their 10,000 square foot mansion and they've got their gold shoes and their toilet paper is made of gold and all the things, you're going to be rewarded if you're blessed if you're suffering, if you're persecuted. And it's not a physical blessing. The blessing is that you get Jesus. You see, Peter's focus is not on what's happening in and now. He's not like, hey, you're going to be blessed. Like, if you get burned alive, it's just going to be the most pleasant experience. Let me say, you, as a follower of Jesus, if you get burned alive, you get your head taken off, whatever it is, you get murdered for your faith, you get Jesus. Either way, you win. That's what he's saying. Let's look at verse 15. I don't think some of y'all believe me. Some of you are like, mm-mm. I see those eyes. Verse 15, but in your hearts, honor Christ as Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone, uh, anyone who asks for you a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Through all of your persecution, through all of your suffering, honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. One of, one of Peter's main, main goals in this letter has been, no matter what you're walking through, no matter what you're facing, honor the Lord in it. Honor the Lord in it. This, this quote from Peter is uh, from the prophet Isaiah in, in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13. He, he says this, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. It's like, wow, that doesn't sound like the New Testament God, does it? Let the Lord be your fear. Let him be your dread. Let, let, let it lead to holiness. And it's interesting how, how the prophet Isaiah connects holiness and fear together. This is not a, one commentary said it this way, is that Peter's words are about living with fear of the Lord rather than the fear of what any man could do to us. Psalmist says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is not a scared fear, like I'm cowering down because I'm afraid something bad is about to happen. This is a, a, a reverent awe and wonder of who God, the creator, all of his majesty. Like, Lord, you created everything that we see and experience. Your, yeah, everything is in your hands and in your control. Like, how does that even happen? Your power and your might, your majesty, it's just all this, this fear of the power of God. So here's a question for you. Do you fear men more than you fear God? Do you fear men more than you fear God? And I think if we're just honest with ourselves this morning, there's probably some situations that we would say yes to that. Just think about this for a moment. How many people have you shared the gospel with in the last month? And if you haven't, is it fear of men? 
Because I, I know that was the case for me. It's like you go to you go to like you go up to the mall and you talk to some random person. Listen, Granny cannot be so nice in the mall. And I didn't want to be rejected by men. So maybe maybe we do maybe we do fear men more than God at times. And it carries on in that same verse, and he says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Uh, the, the word defense is the Greek word apologia. This is where we get the, the word apologetics from. If you ever heard of Christian apologetics, that we are to uh, give a defense for the, for the kingdom of God, for the word of God, for the, king, for the, for the, for the sake of the kingdom. Now, some take this as a in a sense of uh, like a courtroom setting, like give a defense, like you're an attorney and you're standing up for your defense. Uh, that, that's not what Peter is meaning here. This is more in a casual circumstance. Meaning, meaning this, let's just say a coworker asks you, why do you believe what you believe? Why do you live the way that you live? Why, why is it that you do that? And Peter is talking to that person saying, are you able to give an answer for that? Our, our friend Scott Edwards did an incredible class this, uh, maybe it was last, last, this last fall on, on apologetics, and, and, and so, so good. It, it, one of the things that you have to think about is what is our motivation for defending the faith? Is it just because we're Christians and we love arguing? <laughs> like you're good at win, winning arguments. How many, how many is like, I take pride in winning arguments. I love it. It's my favorite thing to do. Ask my wife. <laughs> Here's the honest truth. In the American church, we don't ne know nearly enough theology today. I'm not saying that we need to go back to Sunday school and build all these giant wings of classes. But what I am saying is that when we stop Sunday school, we stop the education in the American church. How are we learning the basics of the Christian faith? I, I want to run just a few questions by you, not to shame you, because hear, hear me this morning. I am not standing as someone on the stage that has everything figured out. And any pastor or preacher that says that all of the theology is 100% right and knows everything from front to back, they're probably not telling you the truth. Because here's I, I, honestly what I believe. When we get to heaven, I think every single one of us are going to be surprised. I'm like, what I thought was such a big deal didn't even matter. What I made like this giant hill out of, like Jesus is like, what? So here's a couple of questions for us. Again, not for shame, just, to, just introspection. Do I know what I believe? Simple question, right? But it's a heavy question. Because if you grew up in the South, like everybody, you know, everybody in the South is a Christ follower. Did you know that? Because they're Southern. I don't think I've ever been to a, a service, like a funeral in the South and be like, that dude didn't know Jesus. They're all going to heaven, evidently. Do I know what I believe? Here's another one. Can I articulate the gospel message? If I was to pull some of you up on stage and say, tell me what the gospel is. Some of you are like, I, I think I'd, I'll pee on the floor. I don't know what to say. I don't know what I'm going to do. Here's another one. How would I respond to a coworker who questions my faith? Now hear me. Again, this does not mean you have to know everything. But it does mean that we should be, should be, we should be growing in our knowledge of who he is. Not so that we can defeat people, but so that we can give an articulate defense for what we believe. I'm going to give you a tip, and I'm going to plug it again. There is course after course on apologetics on Right Now Media. What, what an incredible opportunity to take your young people in your house and say, I want to equip you to be a young man of faith and of knowledge. I want to send you off to college that, to where some professor can't twist something and make you think what you believe is crazy. I want you to have a defense for what you know and you believe. And he carries on with this. And he says, anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. This is the key right here because uh, the idea is that people would be looking at the way that you live and asking about your beliefs because the way that you live looks different than everybody else. Everybody hear that? 
the way that we do this is not through discipline. It's not just through spiritual disciplines. It's not willing ourselves to a legalistic life, but it, it is that we pay attention to our hearts, that we tend to our own soul. And we say, Lord, every single day, would you make me more like you? Every single day. It is a daily choice to submit yourself and your will to the will of the Father and say, God, this is, this is your life that you've given me. I'm just a steward. And so when we pay attention to the soul, when we do that, the outer life is effective. You can focus on the outside and not change the inside, but the opposite is not true. When you allow the Spirit of God to change your heart, the outside will be affected. And here's, here's the thing about apologetics that I wanted to get at and what I was getting at with Scott Edwards. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. People think that apologetics uh, is owning somebody else's beliefs. Like, we're always looking for that mic drop moment. Because of social media, and it's like, there you go. That's not what apologetics is. That's not what it should be. It says do it with gentleness and, and respect for other people. Now, I can't be sure of this, but I'm pretty sure. I don't know anyone that has been one for the kingdom because they were shamed or owned by someone else. So what is our goal? What's the motivation? Is the motivation to win or is it motivation to win their heart for Jesus? It's a big difference. Let's look at verse 16. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your, your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing good evil. Have you ever met the Christian in church that acts like they've never sinned in their entire life? Do you know that person? Have you met that person? <laughs> if not, you probably haven't grown up in church. Because there's one in every church. I don't know who it is yet. We're still looking. <laughs> There's this permeating thought in the word of faith movement that, that we would get to such a level of maturity in our relationship with Jesus that we stop struggling with sin. Actually, I heard a, a popular preacher in the word of faith movement this last week on a, a clip on Instagram, and he was telling his church, and he said, listen, I don't even give sin a thought. I don't struggle with sin. And I was like, liar. Because we all do, don't we? There, I, I can guarantee you if Paul says, who's more Christ-like than any of us in this room, says at the end of his life, I've, got a, I've had a thorn into my side my entire ministry. If he had a thorn in his side, I don't think there's going to be a pastor or a person in America or this world today that could say, I don't know, I don't know what you're struggling with. I just don't do it. That is not the life of following Jesus. So he says, have a good conscience so that you're slandered. What he's not saying is that you are going to be a person of perfect, perfect spirituality. He's not asking you to live a, a perfect life of Jesus, but we are to live in such a way that we can have a clear conscience before men and God. To be a, a person of our word, to be a person of character in the office, these are things that matter to the kingdom. I believe that Christians should be the hardest working, most honest, and have the most character in every office that they work in. Is that true for you? Or have you bought into the, the latter system that says, I, I'll do whatever it takes to step over somebody or push somebody down so that I can continue to grow in my career? Peter's words He's saying, listen, you're going to suffer. It's better to suffer for doing good than for doing some kind of revolutionary act. Let's look at verse 18. We're going to breeze through some of this. It says, for Christ also suffered once for our sins, for the righteousness, or the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. How, 
How can a follower of Jesus face suffering and persecution and be encouraged? It feels like an oxymoron, doesn't it? He says, because Christ set the example for you. For some, not all, but for some, the path of righteousness leads to death. Think about the persecution that happens in a world that was, it seemed like it was just the other day, but it's been years now when Christians were captured in Afghanistan and Iraq and they would live stream their executions. For some, that's what the life of righteousness looks like. It leads to something like death. That's not the case for most of us in this room today, but we can face it because Christ faced it for us. And he says, being put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit. This is the sacrifice on the cross. It was, he was put to death physically, but glorified spiritually. And why is this important for us to, to know as a follower of Jesus? Um, because we think somehow that we are exempt because of the time that we live in, because of the way that we live in, the culture that we live in, that we are exempt from suffering. That if I am suffering, there must be something that I did to cause the suffering. Again, that's some of the word of faith movement. What they would tell you in that kind of atmosphere, in that kind of world, that theological world would be something like this. If you're facing something challenging or suffering, you need to look at your own life and see if there's any sin in your life. Like it's probably your fault. The Lord probably didn't heal that person because you did something wrong. And I, I, I say that because it's such an awful, awful wrong theology that we've got to correct. That is, that is not the loving God that we serve. But again, Christ put to death, made alive in his spirit. And so what does that mean? It means he suffered, we're going to suffer. Christ suffered, you are going to suffer. Christ was persecuted, you're going to be persecuted. He's talking about the, I'm talking about the global church here. But he said, for those that belong to Jesus, your suffering is not the end of the story. Because you will be made alive in the spirit for eternity with the Father. And any amount of suffering that we face on this earth pales in comparison to the gift that we get in eternity with the creator of the universe. It's lights in there. And it says, in which you went out and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Uh, this, this has been a kind of a battleground of sorts in this, this one verse right here uh, since it's writing. Some in early church history and even some earlier translations will say that Jesus went down into Hades and preached and then came back. Um, I don't think that's what happened, um, but I do think that what happened uh, here, most common scholars believe now what Peter is saying is that Christ didn't go down to hell, but simply that he proclaimed his victory over the powers of hell and the darkness of the enemy, uh, uh, the, in, the world of the enemy. That's what he's saying there. Uh, let, me, let me put it into real terms for a second. When you were a little child, little kid, do you remember King of the Hill? Yeah, this is before video games, right? This is before like YouTube and TikTok and all the things that we spend hours on. And you were out in that dirt pile at the baseball field. Well, I don't know why every baseball field has like this giant dirt pile. Do you know that? You've seen that? Like what? You, you're not putting dirt in the infield. That's clay. So why do we have a giant dirt pile everywhere? This is what goes through my mind. I just want y'all to welcome to my world. And I'm on ADDH med, ADD, ADD medicine too. It could be worse. But here's the point, king of the hill. You wrestle and you're throwing people off, right? Like, this is like, this is where like Americans were like, you don't even know back in the day, kid, we were tough, you know? Like, throw you off the hill, you know? You, you were push people off the hill, you get on the top and what do you do? I'm the king, you know? You, you, like, you feel like Braveheart, you're like, yeah! That's essentially what Jesus, or Peter is saying about Jesus. He's not saying that he went down into hell, but he's saying that, that Peter is saying that Christ through his death and his resurrection has defeated death, hell, and the grave, and that he is the ultimate king. Now here's something to pay attention to. Because our temptation will be this. 
is when we face suffering and when we face persecution and when we walk through it and when we get through it to the other side, the temptation will be to allow pride to come inside of us and say, I made it. I did it. I'm the king. We wouldn't say that, but you get what I'm saying. And what Peter is saying is we do not boast in anything that we have done. We boast in Christ and Christ alone. And actually what Paul calls us to do is to boast in our weakness. So instead of saying like, listen, I, I made it, I did it. It's saying, listen, I, I don't know how I made that through if it wasn't for Jesus. I don't know how I made it through that persecution, that suffering. If it wasn't for the Lord walking with me and dealing with me and walking me through it in the middle of it, that is what Peter is saying to do. Let's look at verse 20. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought through the water. The world, from the beginning of time, has been has been uh, antagonistic or in opposition to the ways of God and his kingdom. You think about Adam and Eve. They literally have everything that they need. They're walking in perfect peace. God is literally walking in, the de- in, in, in this garden with them in the cool of the day. I mean, what else could you want? But again, there's something inside human nature that says there's something better. In the days of Noah, they were in opposition to the Lord. He's giving them warning after warning. A flood's coming. A flood's coming. They're, they're still not listening. So here, here's a good principle for us to live by. Don't be surprised when the world tries to push back against the kingdom of God. Don't be surprised. I, this is, this is, I say this all the time. Don't be surprised when the world acts like the world. Why? They don't carry the same beliefs that we carry. People that are not in the kingdom of God, they're not like, you know what? I'm going to follow your beliefs even though I don't believe it. So we should not be surprised. It's not just human forces at work either, is it? We, I feel like I'm just ramming hard on American Christians today, and I'm one of them, but this is just the reality. Because of how we live and where we live, we are sometimes ignorant to the fact that there is a spiritual battle that takes place for our souls. You know, the scriptures in the New Testament talk about spiritual warfare almost more than any other topic. And if you go to churches in America, we almost never talk about it. Why? Because that's what the crazy charismatics do. No, that's what the scriptures do. Is they say there's a, a war for your soul battle going on day in and day out, that the Lord is making intercession for you, that you are secure in him, but there's a battle going on for this world. Thomas Scholar Thomas Schreiner says this, if God preserved Noah when he stood in opposition to the whole world, he will also save his people, even though they are now being persecuted. Because of the work of Christ, we can stand with confidence that he's going to preserve us. Verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Talk about a verse that will make some people mad. This one right here, verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Um, A few years ago, early on in the church planting journey with Collective, we were still at the school, COVID year. And um, we had this gentleman that was coming to our church. Seemed like a nice guy. I'm sure he's a nice guy. Um, I just don't like him. But he... um, He'd been coming, and my conversations with him, that was a joke, I'm sorry. Uh, there, maybe. There was, uh, in my conversations with him, I could tell he knew a lot about the scriptures. I'm having these conversations with him, and, um, and so I do what every normal person does. So I stalked him on Facebook. Uh, so I added him on Facebook, and I found that he had this blog. And he wrote this blog after one of our services about how he'd been visiting this church, and the pastor does not know theology, and he was going on. He wrote this entire blog about me. He didn't save me my name. I wish he would have. That would have been fun. And so I, I sent him a message, and I was like, hey, I would love to meet with you over coffee because that's what Christians do. I didn't say that, but I wanted to. But I do, did have coffee with him. 
in one of those things uh, that he believed that we were wrong on, and, he, and this is the verse that he used in 1 Peter chapter 3, and he said, baptism is what saves you. I was like, well, um, I would say that like all of church history disagrees with you, maybe. But he was dead set on it. And, 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 and this, is, this is why I'm bringing this up, because there are parts of theology that we can, if you take them out of context or you don't do the study, what Peter is saying here, he's not saying that baptism saves you, although it looks like it. It looks like, it. hey, baptism saves you. His entire point in this verse is that just as the water judged the world and saved Noah, it is the water of Jesus that is going to save you and judge the world. He's, he's kind of making this correlation here that, that you, if you have trusted in Jesus, your sins are going to be washed clean just as Noah was saved from the flood and the judgment. Not by our work, but by the work of Christ. By the way, that guy does not go here anymore. Just <laughs> some are like, who is he? <laughs> Verse 22. Who has gone to heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels and the authorities and the powers having been subjected to him. Peter closes this passage out, this chapter, with such a such a powerful theological truth here. Uh, Jesus, after his resurrection, he appears to the disciples, the Mount of Ascension, he ascends them to heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father to rule and to reign. And it, 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 here's what I want you to think about. We sometimes feel in our suffering, and if we were to face persecution, we sometimes feel that God has forgotten you. What Peter's trying to remind the people is no matter what you are facing, even in your suffering and even, your, even in your persecution, the Lord Jesus himself has ascended to heaven and he sits on the throne to rule and to reign over every situation. And I love the mental picture that Jesus would sit. Um, you know, because if you feel like something is out of control, what do you not do? You don't sit, do you? It's like, well, I gotta fix something, I gotta do something. I gotta, I gotta make it happen, I gotta protect, I gotta do all these things. And what does Jesus do in his ruling and his reigning? He's like, I'm gonna sit at the right hand of the Father because I know that everything is in my control. You know, there's that song we used to sing as little kids in children's church. He's got the whole world in his hands. And at some point along the line of our maturity, we've kind of lost the sense that the kids have that God, although it, it seems like, okay, that's, it can be a little cheesy, we're old now, whatever. But the deal is the truth still remains. That he's still ruling and reigning even in the middle of your situation of darkness, even in the middle of your suffering. We serve the victorious savior is what Peter is trying to get into us. And so whether you face persecution, whether your life is taken, whatever the case is, he's saying you have a reward that is coming because you serve Christ. It may happen on this earth, it may not, but in the end, you get Jesus and there's nothing more that you need. I want you to bow your heads with me this morning.